Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey. Alright, so it's Halloween, so let's read about some ghost stories to scare indie devs. There are definitely quite a lot of myths, quite a lot of scary things out there, especially when it comes to indie game marketing. It is something that is very important, and anytime something is important, somehow people start to believe different things. And some people end up believing things and getting really scared of things that are really just myths that there's really nothing to worry about. So we're here, let's read about that. Let's read about seven myths that indie devs get scared by, but really shouldn't because they are myths. Now this was originally an article posted on howtomarketagame.com. That is an excellent blog that I highly recommend you follow. It is a blog by Chris Sukowski. He's a C marketing expert. He definitely knows quite a lot and a lot of my own marketing knowledge I've learned from him. I made a bunch of nice YouTube videos with him. So if you know absolutely nothing about marketing, I definitely recommend you watch these videos. You can check out this page with the link in the description. So here let's read about seven myths that indie devs get scared by, but again, they shouldn't because they are really myths. So number one is how another game developer had my game idea, I'm dead, it's over. And this is definitely a common one, it's definitely one that I've seen many many times, especially when browsing reddit. There's always these kinds of posts being, oh I was going to make a clicker game, but someone already made a clicker game, so there's no point. And really that is very much a myth, that is probably one of the biggest myths of all. Like I wrote here, so this is never the case since the game is a lot more than just an idea. In order for something to go from idea to reality, the developer needs to make hundreds or thousands of tiny decisions that would be impossible for two separate people to make all those decisions exactly the same way. Really just look at game jams, everyone starts from the same idea, the same theme, but the results are all vastly different. And this right here, game jams, that is really the perfect example that should pretty much destroy this myth once and for all. On a game jam, like for example the upcoming official Unity game jam celebrating 20 years, which by the way this is happening next week, so if you're looking for a fun game jam, check it out in the link in the description. But anyways, on a game jam, usually you've got some kind of theme. The jam has a theme that is announced whenever the jam starts, and basically everybody makes a game based on that theme. And yet, even though all those people started from the same idea, like for example here is the GMTK game jam, this is the biggest game jam every single year. This one, the latest one, got 9500 entries. And you can really just look at these screenshots, you don't even have to play the games, you can just look and see all of these are vastly different. And again, all of these really started from the exact same idea. They had the exact same theme, the exact same rules, limitations, and so on, and yet they all end up being vastly different. So really, you shouldn't be scared of this, another game developer had my idea. You really should not be scared about that, because chances are, even if you do have the exact same idea, chances are the game will still be very different. Then myth number two is how wishlists get owned, which apparently they don't. And it's actually a really awesome thing, and this is a myth that I used to believe myself, but apparently based on that, it is not true. Wishlists do not get old. Even if you have some very old wishlists, they will still convert exactly the same. And like I wrote here, so this is a great thing because it means there's no penalty for keeping your Steam page up before launch for a very long time. So you can launch your coming soon page, you can start gathering wishlists. Even if your game release is meant to only release, let's say, one year from now, that's okay because people who wishlist nowadays, statistically speaking, they will still convert exactly the same as people who wishlist just before release. In my case, it's actually very good news. So I announced my game Total Run Liberation about three years ago and currently has 10,000 wishlists. So I'm looking forward to seeing what happens at launch. And if this is my game that I did announce about three years ago, then eventually I got busy with a bunch of other projects, so I had to switch a bunch of things. That game was going to be a lot more complex, so eventually I switched gears and I worked on Dinky Gardens instead, and I did actually manage to start that game and actually publish it within seven months. But still, eventually, I do want to get back to Total War Liberation, possibly next year. And it is great to know that when I do, those 10,000 wishlists that the game currently has, those will still be beneficial whenever I publish the game, even though some of those wishlists are three years old. And if you believe this myth just like I used to believe, if so, then Chris has a bunch of data to basically prove that it really is very much a myth, it is now reality. So here Chris writes, but I see no widespread evidence that wishlists get old. Here are some conversion charts, and we can see, so this is for the game Zero Sievert. This is a massive mega hit and was available on a coming soon page way before it released. Here on SteamDB we can actually see, so we can see the charts, we can see that they first launched the coming soon page in October 21, and the game eventually launched in early access in November 22, so that's one year after, and then three years later they got the final release, and throughout all this time it still sold a ton of copies. Looking at this graph here, so this shows basically the conversion ratio, it shows how many wishlists are added per every single month, that's the blue bar, and the red bar that is basically the conversion rate going anywhere from 10 to 30 percent and you can see even these that were added to the wishlist back in october 2021 these still convert at a ratio of about 20 percent so really roughly the same thing so the conversion rate that really stays roughly flat so there's really no evidence that wishlists get old there's another game down here cosmet here this one is also with a coming soon page for literally years the first one over here this is from february 2018 and then goes all the way up to 22 and again look at that very stable around 20 percent so even very old wishlists, like literally five years old, even these still convert basically exactly the same as the ones added just before launch. Then goes story number three, I don't have a following so my game will never succeed. This is a myth because success usually is based on contacting content creators as opposed to the developer themselves. 
There are some people who think, and honestly, I used to believe this myth as well, that is part of the reason why I started this channel. I thought, okay, I'm going to start a channel, I'm going to teach people game development, and doing so, I'm going to get an audience of people who like my videos, who want to learn game development. Then as soon as I launch a game, those people will buy my game, and that will basically find success. That was kind of one of my rough theories for starting the channel, but I very soon realized that it really does not work that way. It really is very different audiences. An audience that plays a game is very different from an audience that wants to make games. So the idea of let's make some devlogs to attract game developers and hopefully have them buy the game, that theory, that idea usually does not work. The only way that works is if you are basically Danny, if you get literally millions of views on your devlogs, but devlogs in quotation marks, because these devlogs are very much really just about memes. They're really targeting towards a casual audience and not targeted toward game developers. So if you do that, if you focus more on the memes, if so, then yep, you will attract a more mainstream audience. And in that case, the strategy does work out, making videos, making devlogs, attracting people that then buy your game. But if you are just a developer and you are trying to attract other developers, then that theory of starting from your own channel, getting your own audience and finding success, that theory does not work. So the good news is that means this is a myth. So I don't have a following, so my game will never succeed because you don't need a following. What you need is to find someone who does have a following and for that someone to actually play and promote and share your game. Which of course is very difficult, but that's the whole point. You as a developer, you make the game, you contact content creators, those content creators then play the game, and the audience that watches those content creators, those will watch them play that game, and hopefully buy the game themselves and then enjoy it. And of course the other thing is simply Steam itself. So Steam charges 30%, which does sound like a very large amount, and I definitely do wish that it was smaller, especially for indie devs, but still, that 30% really does buy you something very, very good, which is it buys you access to the massive Steam audience, which is about 200 million people. Steam literally has 41 million concurrent players, so in terms of monthly active users, I do think it is about 200 million. So that is basically what you are paying when you pay Steam that 30%. You are paying for access for that massive amount of people. And again, you as a developer, your social media following really doesn't impact that much. It is really either finding content creators and having them push your game, or making something that works perfectly and fits perfectly with the Steam algorithm, and then the Steam algorithm itself won't publish your game. One example of this is Jonas Sirolin. He does have a pretty nice large channel. However, it definitely pales in comparison to how successful his last game was. His last game, Thronefall, has sold over 1 million copies, and the reason why it sold that much was not because of his following on YouTube, but rather because he made a game that really appealed to the Steam audience, to the Steam algorithm, and then the Steam algorithm really found a ton of players that really found the game, and overall positive, so they really loved the game, meaning it showed to more people, more and so on, so that is how it ended up selling millions of copies. It was not because of his initial social media following, but rather because the game is excellent, the game appeals to the Steam audience, and then Steam itself promoted the game. Then goes story number four. I shouldn't market my game because someone will steal my game idea. And this is an interesting one because it kind of goes back to the first myth, the thing that idea is really all that matters when it really isn't, it's execution. The exact same idea being executed in different ways will yield different results. But still, technically, if you do talk about your idea, Technically, there is the potential for someone to steal it if your idea is very far along. The clear example is how there's actually a mobile ripoff of Thronefall. One mobile developer that is completely unrelated to Jonas pretty much just remade the game. It's almost like a complete copy and it found tons of success and it's making millions of dollars. So in this case, technically this did happen. Someone did steal his game idea. But the important thing about this and why this is more considered a myth as opposed to reality is because this really only happens if you're already insanely successful. Meaning, if you are just a first time in developer and you are trying to make your very first game, don't be afraid of telling about your idea because nobody will actually spend the effort to try to clone your idea. Only after you find an insane amount of success, only after that will people actually try to clone your idea. But by that point, hopefully you've already found so much success that hopefully even something like this will not bother you. So this gift right here is basically the perfect example of this myth. So yes, technically, if it does happen, it won't suck. Somebody stealing your idea but it literally only happens after you've already made millions of dollars. So this is pretty much the accurate representation. Then if you want, you can use that money to hire lawyers to try to go after the people who stole your idea. But at that point, I would really just say, just be insanely happy with yourself that you achieved the impossible, you found insane success to the point that someone actually tried to steal your idea. Go story number five. I shouldn't reach out to a content creator until close to launch because I won't have blown my one shot. And it's actually an interesting one. It kind of goes back to the other myth, the myth that wishlists get old, which they don't. So if you find a content creator that likes your game, if they generally like your game, then chances are they won't play it more than once. And if they play it more than once, and if you are in development for many years, then of course it makes sense to contact them as soon as you have something that is playable and people might want to play. You can have someone play your game, you get a bunch of wishlists, then again, since those don't get old, you are constantly just adding more wishlists as that content creator plays your game more and more. Again, the whole thing is based on having an actual good game. But for example, here's the result. Here's the game tape to tape. This was very successful. Here it is. This one has over 2,000 reviews. Same point where you make a hit, even though it's still in early access. And this one over here, Northern Lion, pretty massive streamer. 
he played the game multiple times. So every time that he played the game, it adds more and more wishlists to the game, which then ended up being a massive success. So of course, make sure you only contact those content creators once you have something that is actually valuable and that is actually worthy of being shown. So don't contact people showing your alpha screenshots. No, don't do that. But if you have something that is already very solid, already plays well, if so, then definitely go ahead and send them an email. And later on, when you are close to release, send another email. If you do manage to achieve this, if you manage to achieve a content creator that plays your game multiple times, again, really just adds more and more wishlists, which increase your odds of finding success. Then go story number six. Your game announcement had low wishlists. Your game is doomed forever. So this is interesting because it's sort of a myth and sort of not a myth. Again, the thing that is a myth is basically what it writes here. So if you launch a Steam coming soon page, the wishlists are low in the first two weeks. Valve puts a black mark of doom on your game and it will be forever hidden from the algorithm. So this part here, this specific interpretation, this is definitely a myth. There's no black mark on the algorithm. If the game underperforms at launch, then it will probably underperform for a while. But if you do manage to find an audience and the game starts performing more normally, if so, then the Steam algorithm will be more than happy to promote it. So there's really no black mark. The algorithm is brazenly reacting on a daily basis. So if at launch it doesn't do well, then it won't get much visibility. But if you manage to push some traffic onto it and people actually like the game, then it will gain more and more visibility. So if you do get low wishlist at launch, that sucks. That is going to be a bit harder to come back from that. And perhaps it might be a signal that the game is perhaps not as interesting as you think it might be. Or perhaps you really just might have, let's say, just a bad launch trailer, just a bad store page, but the game itself might still be good. And if that is the case, you can definitely get back from that. Because again, there's really no black mark. So if the underlying game is good, and if over time you manage to convince people to wishlist the game and that they want the game, the Steam algorithm will be very happy to promote you further and further. And go story number seven. So that AAA game everyone is talking about is launching. When my game launches, I will be bearing. And it's actually a very funny example because we had a, an actual real example that happened just recently. So we're here. So the recent Silk Song release is an excellent example of this myth. And I even made two videos specifically talking about this myth, one before release and one analyzing the results after. So the theory being that Silk Song and let's say any kind of AAA game, those are definitely massive. Don't get me wrong. I mean, Silk Song is, was massive, was a massive release. But when you put it into context with everything that is on Steam, even though it is massive, it is really just a tiny, tiny thing. So over here, Silk Song launched, again, massive game, half a million players. That is an insane amount, especially for an indie game. That puts it on the top, let's say, 5% of indie games. That is an insane amount. However, half a million users, whilst that is still a lot, that still pales in comparison to Steam's 38 million. So it might seem like Silk Song is literally capturing 100% of the entire player base, but in reality, it's really just 5%. So I made this video, don't be afraid of Silk Song, and that is really what I said, which is how Steam is so massive that even though Silk Song is massive, you don't have to be afraid of it unless you are competing on the exact same genre. As long as you're on a different genre, then it really will not affect you at all. And this video was actually quite interesting because it got quite a bunch of dislikes, quite a bunch of comments that were disagreeing with my theory. So then I made another video right after Silk Song was released in order to analyze the results and see what exactly happened. And it could happen exactly what I said. So games that were not in the same genre that launched pretty much on the exact same date as Silk Song those still found exactly the amount of success that we're expecting. So this very much is a myth. If a AAA game or some kind of massive indie game comes out at the same time as your game, as long as you are not on the exact same genre, chances are it will not matter. The gaming market is so insanely massive that there's more than enough space for multiple games to launch on the exact same date without cannibalizing each other, again, assuming they are not on the exact same genre. Chris actually wrote another very interesting blog post on the way back in 2023. It's about the other game that succeeded during this Starfield launch. So Starfield, that's a massive AAA game. This was basically the next game after Skyrim, so people were insanely hyped for it, which meant that a bunch of people tried to avoid it, so they did not launch when Skyrim launched, except for this game, Chill Aquarium. This one did decide to launch on the exact same day. And what was the result? Well, the result was actually found massive success. This game made millions of dollars, despite launching on the exact same day, and actually found more success because of it, because so many other indies, they tried to avoid the Starfield launch. That means that on that day and on that week, not many games were launched. So that means that Chill Aquarium was available over here on the popular coming page. So this leads to a lot of visits to the store page and basically stayed here for a very long time because very few games actually launched during that time. So yeah, so basically the message is don't be scared. At least don't be scared of these seven myths because they are very much myths and not something for you to waste energy being scared over. Yep, this was a really awesome blog post. I really enjoyed reading it. Like I said, I've got a bunch of videos that I did with Chris. So if you want to learn more about Steam Game Marketing, check it out to the link in the description. And I wrote about this in my Game Dev Report newsletter. This is the newsletter that I write every single week with any interesting articles that I come across that week. Check it out to the link in the description. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.